Kentucky Cooking Chats. I'm your host Jo Whitten and today we have another behind the scenes interview with a local foodie. I meet so many interesting foodies on my travels and also here in Far North Queensland and I love chatting to them about their stories of how they got to where they are now, um, their story of how they got interested in maybe um, the food scene or in healthy eating or in healing with food. I love hearing um, what they've learnt over the years about food and life, the produce they use, um, all sorts of interesting lessons can be learnt from listening to other people's stories and I just find them fascinating. So lately I've been interviewing a few of these foodie friends. Um, one of my favourite whole food chefs um, is Jude Blareau and I recently interviewed her and she talked about the importance of joy and deliciousness in your cooking and she considers them to be nutrients in their own right. Um, she talks about why sweetness is not a dirty word and how there needs to be balance um, when you're aiming for a whole food healthy diet there needs to be balance and not stress. Um, I talked to my good friend Helen Marshall from Primal Alternative who has a really successful Australian and international business um, helping people to start baking from home and selling to their community. I've also interviewed people that are not so much foodies but um, have some input into nutrition um, from a medical perspective. For instance, Dr. Pran Yoganathan, who is a gastroenterologist in Sydney. Um, he talks about the meat question because there's so much confusion at the moment about meat and whether we should be eating it and is red meat um, healthy, does it cause cancer, all of those kind of questions. So that was a really interesting interview. If you haven't heard that one, you can have a look at that one on my podcast and my YouTube channel. Um, but close to my heart are the far north Queensland foodies who are doing very interesting things here in the north of Australia and we are um, so proud of the produce that we have in our local area. So recently I've been talking to a few of the local chefs and restaurateurs and growers and producers and I'm so excited to share with you today an interview that I did with Ollie James, Oliver James from um, Cairns. So he is a restaurateur that owns a few cafes in Cairns, a coffee roasters, um, a business where you can learn to be a barista, um, and he also judges international coffee competitions, barista competitions, and he's just an all round amazing guy. So I really hope you enjoy this interview. We talk about everything from coffee to vanilla to bush beef to what is local food. So I hope you enjoy. things going um, with the plans for the bush beef trip? Ah, going good after our little uh, reschedule. <laughs> yeah. How many people have you got? Uh, we've got about eight interested. Oh, that's so we've good. got only 12 spots. Yeah. Okay. Coffee made by the master himself. Yeah. The Cairns Barista Champion. <laughs> oh, I've lost the time, <laughs> Oh, much better than me. <laughs> How did you go at the Melbourne, or oh, was the international um, coffee championships? Thank you. Oh, How did you go down in Melbourne? Yeah, good. Yeah, very interesting. Enjoy the judging. Yeah, fun to judge the international judges. Yep. So there's uh, obviously cultural differences in the coffee communities and the way we drink and think about coffee. Um, and that was kind of interesting to explore. Yeah, it looks like fun. Beautiful. Hey everyone, welcome to Quirky Cooking Chats and thanks so much for being here, Ollie. It's great to be here. So good to have you on the show. Um, Ollie has an amazing cafe in Cairns. Well, he has a few. Um, Gayala is the one that we're at today and for those of you who visit Cairns and ask me for somewhere to go for good coffee I always say Gayala or caffeine <laughs> always <Thank you. laughs> um, and caffeine is um, one of the other cafes that 
um, Ollie owns as well as I think Newell Street and um, there's also the Tattooed Sailor Coffee Roasters on the shirt there. Woo! <laughs> and the coffee school. So you can learn to make good coffees there. Absolutely. My son Isaac wants to go to your school. So we're here to chat today about some of the projects that Ollie has going and um, first of all I'd love for you to share with my listeners about your story, how you got into the food scene. Um, we have amazing produce here in Far North Queensland so we want to talk a bit about that mm. um, and yeah what, what you've got going on. So yeah if you could give us a bit of a background. Um, so yeah I basically grew up in hospitality. Mm. My dad opened a restaurant um, when I was quite young, when I was nine years old. Oh, okay. Yeah, he um, was always a really good cook and he was, he was inspired, um, his inspiration came from his mum actually. And I think it's, uh, yeah, cooking and the love and appreciation of good food is transferred. Yep, definitely. Yeah, lots of uh, interesting craft. I think there's a transference of skills rather than uh, going to school and learning yeah. from books and uh, theory. I think, uh, yeah, that extends to a lot of other areas of mm. crafting, which, um, yeah, cooking, I, th I believe, is family in that field. Um, yeah, so Dad opened a restaurant, is in the countryside of New South Wales, about an hour and a half drive south of Sydney. Yeah. And in the Southern Highlands. Beautiful and, area. Yeah, beautiful, stunning area. Mm. And he, he was inspired from the cooking side from his, his mum, who was a great cook, but also from his travels to France, mm. where they had you know great countryside restaurants in villages just open on the weekends and um, really focused on local produce and showcasing you know simple menus. And mm. so, yeah, he opened this restaurant, um, the Exeter Studio Restaurant, it was called, um, and grew a lot of his own produce. I love that. Had chickens. And uh, when I visited him on uh, school holidays and every third weekend there for a while, um, yeah, I'd be working on the floor. From the and time I, you were little? So, yep, yeah, since I was little. And one of my favourite parts of that experience was actually the coffee machine. I think, I don't know what fascinated me about it so young, but I was fascinated by it. I think I saw how people lit up when they had coffee <laughs> and got super excited about it. So and, true. Uh, so this is 1990. So big foam dome cappuccinos. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm so I used to pride myself on making those big foamy cappuccinos. And yeah. there's a little lever machine, so I'd have to hang off the lever or sometimes ask someone to help me to Aww. pull the shots. <laughs> That's cute. Yeah, I'd pack the coffee and do the milk and chocolate on top and take it out. It was fun. Oh, I love it. So that yeah. was your beginning of um, the love for coffee. And I guess you would have had all that beautiful, fresh whole food produce mm. what kind of things did your dad make in the restaurant was, yeah the menu was very french inspired mm -hmm. um countryside you know so appropriately you know rustic sort of fresh mm. produce meals um very seasonal he's uh, you know his process he was only open on the weekends friday saturday sunday so his process would start thursday morning and he would drive to flemington markets in sydney mm -hmm. and just buy boxes of fresh produce that was good and then go to the fish markets, um, Sydney fish markets, oh, and buy some love seafood. Love the Sydney fish markets. Yeah, Amazing, and he would really. he would basically create the menu in those two shops. Wow, just depending on what he could get. Yeah, depending on what yeah. he could get, and obviously it was, it, um, you know, it wouldn't be a new menu every weekend. It would just slowly evolve with the seasonal changes and uh, what was good that. in the fish markets. Yeah. And then he would stop at the butchers on the way home in the Highlands and mm -hmm. buy some meat. And that would be his menu. It was a chalkboard menu, three entrees, you were just three mains, three desserts, 25 bucks a head. Oh. Bargain. Why don't we have more of those restaurants again? <laughs> um, slowly as the older I get, the closer I'm coming back to oh, that. I just love it. I just, that's the mm. kind of food that just makes your heart sing when it's fresh and local and just in season and every time you go there's something different it's like oh, what mm. are they doing with the zucchini what are they doing with the you know all the different local produce i love that kind of food do you do much of that in your restaurants do you do much of the local sorry this is going on kicking. not enough of it still working on that yeah i, I guess it. it's a lot of work i suppose constantly changing mm. yeah yeah Depends there's on. a there's a certain scale required for cafe mm. so it's a low spend per head 
Yeah, that's true. And so you mm. need more people mm -hmm. to make all the numbers work, mm -hmm. pay the rent, pay the staff, pay yep. everything. Um, so there's not so much time in the week to focus on that, I guess. Mm. Yeah, so I do bits and pieces where we can. Um, yeah, we buy a lot from Simon and George. They're a local yeah. wholesaler of produce. And, uh, you know, they they have markets, presence in the markets in Brisbane and Sydney and Melbourne. Oh, okay. Down the East Coast. So they use cans as a, basically as a sourcing base for the produce from the tablelands to send down there. Ooh, um, go tablelands. Yeah, absolutely. So, <laughs> So for me, I can, you know, I can source that produce from the tablelands through Simon and George. Yeah. And then, you know, they have trucks going up and down the coast. Mm. So then they're bringing some bits and pieces up from the colder yeah. climates that we can't grow here, particularly the leafy green stuff. Yeah. Because it's just too hot. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I'm, I, you know, guess in a roundabout way. Yeah. We use a lot of local produce. Yeah. And uh, the menu design is, is really focused around mostly um i guess asian influence because that's mm -hmm. what a lot of that kind of stuff grows up here yeah you know if i think cold climate european classics like um god suede's and asparagus and mm. fennel and you know all these kind of really fun stuff um these are really cold climate things yeah. and they don't grow here whereas all the asian tropical yeah. stuff just chilies yeah all those you know Greens like the bok choys and choy songs and yeah, all that sort of stuff goes really well in tablelands. Every time I've got friends that come <coughs> up here and I take them to the Rusty's markets, the local markets, they are blown away by the local produce. Mm. It's like we have such a huge variety of produce here. It's really good. Um, and I know at home on the tablelands, I do find that I'm able to grow the fennel and the leafy greens have gone crazy and the... Um, button squash and things like that but probably not for very long they're probably all gonna be too hot soon and usually yeah in the flip mm. res reverse months so yeah in, in winter right which is uh, kind of crazy if you were living down south yeah but nothing grows in winter down there. that's right that's when everything's going well here yeah yeah and it's really this time you know the end of september the spring mm -hmm. that's um you know you're starting to harvest from the veggie garden again yeah so i'm yeah. getting all the tomatoes coming on now and yeah, so it is It is different if you're used to down south, but you've been here for how long? On and off, 20 years. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, because you went to school a bit up on the table end. So I finished high school yeah. in Atherton. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Um, so the coffee that you use here, do you have any local coffee in your blends? Yeah, we use um, some Skyberry coffee. Yahoo! Yeah, from one <laughs> of our blends. Um, it's a... Uh, it's expensive. Green beans mm -hmm. grown in Australia are quite expensive yeah. in comparison to what we can buy from developing countries. Like not it's mostly bad. a labour cost uh, yeah. and an input issue, mm. or not issue, but challenge, mm. I guess, yep. for Australian coffee farmers. Um, it's not deterring them though. There's a bunch of coffee farmers mm. up there. Yeah, Lucy, who you saw yeah, this morning, Crater up at Crater Mountain. Mountain. Yeah, she's given it a good crack and. Um, yeah, the Murats, they've recently bought their coffee farm online the last couple of years. Okay, I don't know you there. And then some of the older guys like House, you know, they do absolutely huge volumes. Oh, okay. Um, the biggest of ever are there and Skyway, of course, who I work closely with. Yep. And the Jacques. Yeah. The, the boys there. Yeah, know them. Yeah. So there's a, there's a fair bit of, I guess, a fair bit of coffee growing up there. Yeah. So um, can you tell us a bit about the coffee roasters that you have? Um, the roaster business. <laughs> um, so how does that work? You get the beans in from all over the place and then you have your own recipes? Yeah, roasting, my approach to coffee roasting is like cooking, yeah. actually, mm -hmm. which sets me apart a little bit from my other roasting peers, mm -hmm. I think. Um, and the, I guess the motivation to roast coffee is from being able to source my own green beans, my own yeah. ingredients and then to create flavors through the blends mm -hmm. that I want to serve to cans, locals, and drink myself every day. Yeah. The inspiration. When I first started roasting, it was really after a trip to Ethiopia. Mm. Yeah, and this trip, um, 
long story, met some Dutch people, got on this amazing trip with a big, quite a big Dutch importer of green coffee who has a really interesting kind of business model by um, supporting farmers to become organic mm, and to good. increase their quality mm -hmm. in coffee um, by basically donating machinery and equipment. Wow. And then buying all of the green beans from that mill. That's amazing. Yeah. But that trip to Ethiopia really changed my idea of local. Yeah. Actually. Up until then, yeah, I, I guess I had a fairly common idea of local, which is buy from, you know, somewhere grown near you for yeah. good reasons. You know, it's fresh and you're supporting the local economy and um, it makes sense to eat it there. Mm -hmm. Usually it's in season. Yeah. But um, going to Ethiopia gave me a different perspective in that I came away with this idea of a net humanitarian benefit per dollar spent. Love it. So if I was to buy green coffee from um, Skyby Coffee Farm, which I do, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's supporting that family there and a bunch of workers and, mm. and that farm. Um, but for every dollar I spend in Mariba, you know, if I spend that in Ethiopia, I'm, I'm supporting a huge number more people, yeah. True. actually. And mm -hmm. if the money is getting to the people, which is often an issue with you know, supply chain, and we're very conscious of that in coffee, particularly. Yeah. Um, yeah, the net humanitarian benefit is like a village of 800. Yeah. And that was a really interesting idea. That is a really good good thought because, you I mean, the world is a village. <laughs> yeah, it's we're a global all, village. We're all connected. Yeah. We look after each other. Yeah. Yeah. So on this trip in 2015 with Menno, um, the Dutch importer with Traboka, you know, we went into some very remote uh, places yeah. super remote and wow, he has cult amazing. status there <laughs> honestly he's like he's uh, helped so many people yeah so mm -hmm. he'll go i dare to say he's single-handedly helped ethiopia wow. get back on the quality map over the past 20 25 years wow. but the projects he was running to do with the quality of cherry picking he would pre-purchase or give you know money up front and mm. equipment up front for them to do the harvests you know, in the farming cycle, often farmers are paid much, much later than yeah. shipping product, but the farmers need the money the most before they harvest. Yeah. You know, for the drying beds and for diesel and running, you know, paying people and buying cherries and yeah. for all these reasons, the money in that coffee supply chain ends up in the hands of the people at the wrong time. Yeah. And so they're relying, you know, farmers rely on that last year's cash coming in to set them up for next year so there's always this kind of playing forward and uh, in countries like Ethiopia it's really subsistence living yeah that's not entirely practical yeah yeah well, it sounds like an amazing guy yeah so that was pretty much a beginning for you a bit yeah. of a mentoring I got back to Australia and I uh, immediately sought to buy a roaster so I could start buying green beans differently that's awesome. yeah it was good it's very interesting. The roasting yeah. business is, um, yeah, it's successful in ways other than financial yeah. monetary. And that's, yeah, that's the true meaning of success, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah it, it kind of, it's a break-even business for me. Mm -hmm. I spend a lot of money on green beans in comparison yeah. to many other roasters that I know. And, uh, yeah, I just, it's I, like I said, I, I approach it like cooking. Mm -hmm. So the ingredients in... You know, good ingredients in, you get quality out the other yep. side. It's pretty simple. Yeah. Lots of people, I think, overcomplicate the whole roasting coffee process. And okay. I think if you can toast bread, you can roast coffee, essentially. Ooh. If you buy really good <laughs> ingredients. <laughs> my sister just has... just you know, bugger it up. Yeah. My sister has <sighs> quite a bit of coffee growing on her property. And she's been trying to play with it, figure it out. <laughs> like, you better go and do um, Ollie's course. <laughs> There's, yeah. a, there's a whole bunch more things go wrong at a farm level. Yeah, right. And at the barista level, yeah. on the machine, oh. I think then in the roast process. Right, okay. In terms of all of the steps from the cherry to the cup that a coffee goes through. Yeah. The roasting step is just a, a brief window in time. Yeah. And fairly easy to get right. Okay. 
Yeah, there's so many variables, <laughs> like you say, as same with cooking. Um, it amazes me how you can get such a different cup of coffee from the same coffee from two different baristas. Like, I don't understand how that works. Mm. But yeah, it's, it's interesting. Because, yeah, it's the variables in the extraction. Okay. It's, it's very hard to consistently extract coffee the same way. Yeah. Extremely hard. I always get a good coffee, cup of coffee here though. Yes. <laughs> um, so when it comes to the other produce in you know the local area, we've been especially interested in hearing about the bush beef, which oh, yeah. you are working with the people up in Normanby Station, is yeah. it? Do you want to tell us a bit about that? Yeah, that so I was, awesome. I was brought onto the project by an old uh, colleague, Mike Weiner, um, who's He's been around uh, the indigenous kind of projects scene in the Cape for a long time. Yeah. Maybe 30 years, maybe longer. Okay. Yeah. He's uh, So he's kind of heading towards retirement and wants to put some you know, little runs on the board for himself. He's gone out on his own. Um, so he asked me to get involved with this uh, bush beef project just from the, I guess, the food service, yeah. hospitality side. Mm -hmm. um, the Norman B Station is uh, basically freehold. Okay. Yeah, and uh, owned by an Aboriginal family. And that's up in the Cape? Yeah. For those who don't know this area. It's a few hours past Cooktown. Yeah. Middle okay. of Whoop Whoop. It would be amazing up there. I've seen yeah. some of your photos and I had a look at their Instagram. Yeah, mm. it's really interesting country. There's all that escarpment through Laura. Yeah. You know, from sort of between Cooktown and Laura. And Lakeland Downs, there's this kind of huge land area that's, um, you know, got a lot of history, Indigenous mm. history and white history, um, with gold rushes and all sorts of things. Yeah, I've read some of the history. It's so interesting. And a I lot think, of sad history. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of sad yeah. history there. Mm. Um, battle Camp is aptly named. There's wow. a lot of battles between the colonists and, you know, the Indigenous groups there. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's a lot of cave paintings there. Yeah, that looked amazing. So you yeah. can go on tours up there. and Yeah, the yeah. Normandy guys do tours on their rock art. Maybe I'll get up there cool. sometime. Yeah, you should. Mm, it's very interesting. To. Yeah, so uh, I went up there and met the guys um, on the station and hung out for a couple of days. And yeah, we did a function here at Cofella to promote their beef. And I guess my involvement was to showcase the beef to hospitality and public mm -hmm. and also give you know feedback back to the guys mm. about you know there, there being a potential market and excitement about it around yeah. it um, so we used it as a test project essentially the, the slaughtering and then the butchering and then you know the cooking and retailing I guess yeah and did it, it work good. out yeah the way that they hoped I think it was yeah they were quite surprised that the process wasn't too difficult. Yeah. Quite straightforward. So at the yeah. moment, they're still building up the business? They're still building up the business, yeah. yeah. So this was really a trial, yeah. a test um, of those processes and really showcase to the guys that they, they have got something special there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So they've just basically, there's wild cattle yeah. all in that area. Like how big an area are we talking? Do you know? Well, I'm not very good at no. sizes. Okay. A big area. Huge. It's a big station. <laughs> With lots of cows. <laughs> From my understanding, and I might be wrong, but my understanding is that over the years there's been this boom and bust cycle mm. with cattle stations in the yeah. Cape. Not just at Normanby or around Normanby, but you all know, right. all throughout. Yeah. And uh, because of the size of the land, there's no fences. Yeah. So, you know, landowners would just have these huge, massive parcels of land and let the cattle go and then right muster there. them up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, often those cattle are fattened up somewhere down here in this vale, yeah. cave land somewhere, and then sent off yep. to the slaughterhouse um, with a bit more weight on them. Mm -hmm. And that's a fairly common practice, I think, throughout Australia, not just yeah. Cape York. So yeah, these guys are pulling the bush beef. They're just running free, mm -hmm. running wild. Having so, a good life. Yeah, living their best lives yeah. if they survive. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the ones that survive are obviously a bit tougher and a bit smarter than the other ones. Um, and they're not, they're certainly not fat, they're lean. Yeah, so it's more yeah. like wild meat. It is wild meat, mm. yeah, with, a, with an environmental 
benefit to it, which is really wild. Yeah, talk <laughs> about talk about that. Well, the so so the guys do a couple of projects on their land um, with support from the reef and one of the reef foundations, uh, and I think the Queensland government are involved to minimise the erosion on creeks because all that soil erosion that starts up, you know, inland gets to the coast eventually and that's all the silt. You know, there's been massive projects for silt and mm. chemicals off farms and all sorts of things down yeah. the coast to protect the reef. And yeah, so they, cattle um, are really not very good for those gullies and causing erosion. Mm -hmm. So pulling, them, pulling the cattle down and pulling them off the station helps yeah. reduce the silt to the and it's just reef. So it's basically that over the years they, they've just really expanded in that area, just gone wild and bred up. And so they're just basically culling and... Yeah. yeah. I think the idea is to reduce cattle to a manageable amount, you mm. know, use the, prof the profits and the proceeds from getting the, the cattle off there to run a small station. Yeah. Um, I th yeah, I don't think they've determined what happens next. Mm. I think they're focused on this, you know, really close next step. Yeah. Um, but there's a lot of cattle up in Cape York. Yeah, so it would take a while. <laughs> so how do people buy that meat? That's still not worked out. Okay, not worked out yet. <laughs> yeah. Stay tuned. Um, yeah. And what about also roux meat and other, like, you know, like the... I'm trying to think what else I heard recently of wild goat. You know, like, is there other... Is this happening elsewhere with wild... I sort haven't done that sort of research. Don't know. Yeah, my mate Mike has uh, done okay. a fair bit of that. He's, yeah. he's kind of like, yeah, the brains behind it all and doing all the research and comparisons. Yeah. Um, but I, I know of kangaroos and certainly camels. Mm. Um, That's true, they yeah. do use that too, and don't they? We've got yeah. wild deer on the tablelands from farms where they've escaped and gotten out. Like, it's really interesting to think of I think people get used to the farmed meat and the grain fed and they don't sometimes understand how to cook the more lean gamey meat mm. um but it's got to be good for you right like the I, real thing <laughs> yeah i think so yeah it's not yeah it's not got any hormones or any grains or any you know the human bush... involvement interference yeah. yeah the bush beef we we um uh, ate here and yeah what did you what did you do with it uh we, do you know? we did a nose to tail kind of thing i hate mm. using that word but yeah. that's essentially what it was we yeah. used all bits of the uh, cow mm. in different ways yeah yeah showcase different parts differently so a lot of slow cooking would it be or? a fair bit of slow mm. cooking yeah we did a couple of steaks um from the from the tomahawks just to showcase nice. that nice. yeah um but yeah most lots of like uh yeah slow braises mince we did the liver and the tongue and awesome. yeah, good, little bits of the offal as well. No waste. <laughs> well, Low waste. There is a lot of waste. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's so good to be able to, like I love to buy beef in bulk and just get whatever I get and then figure out ways to use it. And that's, you know, what my mum taught me because that's how she grew up. Um, yeah. And, you know, not just going and buying steak and mince, steak and mince, sausages, steak and mince, you know, <laughs> like actually getting a, like a quarter of an animal in the freezer and then you pull things out and go okay what can i make with this <laughs> yeah it's really that's interesting you yeah. say that because one of the i guess one of the um main uh challenges for the guys at normandy is going to be how to sell mm. all of the beef yes yeah and process it in a way that's probably not quite like you know going to the butcher shop yeah I, for me that was one of the personal lessons that I got out of the whole experience in the last few months yeah. was this kind of change in thinking about yeah. how ridiculously spoiled we are in the food industry just to order, mm. you know, we order three pork bellies a week and, yeah. you know, if you could just order a bunch of scotch fillets, you could, or tea yeah. whatever it is, but then what happens to the rest of the exactly. animal and yeah. there's some, yeah, I started thinking about that yeah. and so getting two whole beasts and having to think about how to break mm -hmm. it down, how to store it, how to cook it, mm -hmm. you know, really got me thinking more about how we buy meat in the food industry. Mm, and the waste that goes on and yeah, and that's something that I try to um, mm -hmm. sort of educate people on how to use different things like the livers, the hearts, the, 
I'm not very good with tongue and brains, but my mum is. And if I ever don't know how to do something, I just ring her. <laughs> I was um, cooking at an Indigenous retreat up in Darwin and um, some of the people brought me a possum to cook. Did I tell you about that? I think you've mentioned yeah, this before. Yeah, and um, so I was just like... I'm not sure how I feel about it. I really don't know how to cook a possum. <laughs> I'm like, ring my mum. Mum, how do I cook a possum? She knew. She told me how to cook the possum. So, yeah, it's, it's just... How did it taste? I didn't get to taste it oh. so yeah they um it was actually a really funny story because mum said make sure it's got you know water in there you want to cover it well put some herbs salt and pepper just low and slow plenty mm. of you know moisture um and we'll need a, like half a day kind of thing wow. in a low oven and we got through about two hours and then they came in and said, we want our possum. And I was like, it's not cooked. They said, oh, we'll just finish it over the fire. I'm like, okay. And of course then it was tough. So mm. <laughs> I said, how was it? And they said, no, it was really tough. I mm. said, you should have let me finish cooking. Mm. But um, yeah, I think it was really funny. I think a lot of these gamey kind of meats, you do need, um, yeah, the moisture, the old fashioned cooking techniques. Mm. Um, yeah, low oven or slow cooker or whatever and, and learning to use up all the bits. And then of course we do all the stocks and the, you know, things like that with the bones, the stocks and the broths and then the mm. pâtés and mincing up liver and heart and putting it through the beef mince to make a beautiful rich ragu or something like that. There's so many things that you can do and it's just, it's just, um, well, finding the recipes sometimes but also just giving it a go and yeah so yeah and the flavors I find with those slow cooked um, meats that people sort of don't bother with a lot of times they're so flavorsome yeah so much flavor yeah that's what we found with the bush beef yeah so much flavor well, I can't wait to try it you better let me know when you have another dinner yeah. <laughs> I'll be down we made some uh, <laughs> meat pies beef and Guinness pies oh nice with this bush beef and they were spectacular. Mm. Actually, everything we've done with it is really yummy because it's got that extra element of being more beefy than normal. Wild taste, that yeah. gamey taste. Slightly gamey, but yeah. really beefy. Oh, that's interesting. We were running a special at Caffeine this week with burgers with some of the mints we made from the neck. Oh. That was uh, really tasty. I didn't oh know God. about that. I might have to go there for lunch. Yeah. <laughs> oh wait, did I have lunch already? I did. Rats. Yeah, <laughs> we've stored a bit down in the freezer, so we're going to slowly just run specials with the bush beef and caffeine. Mm. Yeah, and uh, kind of use that feedback yeah. from customers and also, you know, through the process with the chefs. Yeah. You know, Start kind of to feedback get some... into the project. Yeah, that's really good. And then that's mm. a way to support the people there on the station as well. That's really good. Um, what other What other exciting projects have you been involved with lately? I'm always interested to hear what you're doing because you're just like, he's got so many fingers in so many pies. <laughs> yeah, it's, my, it's the way my brain works. Beef and Guinness pies. <laughs> I love complexity and I love a challenge, especially challenging Same. myself. Yeah, I find I get a huge reward from the personal growth of, yeah. of um, all the bits and pieces that I do. Yeah. And yeah, I, I think I get bored easily. <laughs> Yeah, so my challenge is to start projects that, I'm gonna, that I know I'm going to finish. <laughs> yeah. that, can, that are going to keep you interested. Yeah. yeah, sometimes it yeah. works out, sometimes it doesn't. Yeah. Um, what other projects? On the front of my mind, I'm going to uh, Melbourne next week to judge barista competitions. That's exciting. Very exciting. How did you get into that? Uh, by competing. Okay. Um, years ago, the competitions would come regional um, and to Cairns. And so I was involved in that for a few years while it was still running and won the last one we held here in Cairns. Ooh, yeah, so good. reigning Cairns was the champion. Oh, By well done, well done. Cairns comp. <laughs> uh, so good. Yeah, that's a funny claim to fame. Um, <laughs> but through that experience of going to Brisbane to compete against the other, you know, regional um, competitors, I guess, yeah, I, I discovered that competing was um really a lot more difficult than it looks from the outside mm. and requires a lot of resources and a lot of time um, yeah. which at, at that time i didn't have but i was invited to get involved by judging so just you know rock, rock up and yeah with a palette and an open mind and <laughs> read the rules from front to back twice you yeah. know like 
Yeah. And just I just kept showing up at the comps. That's good. And uh, yeah, so I got world qualified a couple of years ago, and wow. this will be the world competition held in Melbourne. This world next competition. Week. Oh world. my goodness, that's exciting. So I well, I really hope we get some far north Queensland coffees placing. There is. Really? I've heard one, maybe competitor from Zurich, don't quote me on that, but a competitor is bringing some of Lucy's. I did hear Mountain that. Coffee. She told me that. Yes. Swedish, is it? Is that Zurich? Swedish. Yeah. Switzerland? Switzerland, okay. I think Sorry. It's Swiss. Yeah. Sorry, yes. <laughs> but that's exciting. Yeah, that's so and, exciting. Uh, I am going to um, go out to Lucy's um, plantation and do a video sometime, so. She's a fascinating character. She is such a she's such a laugh. She's, she, <laughs> she's but a she's very clever. Yeah. I really hope she wins something. She's yeah. It's it's um it's great to have a couple of more coffee farmers in the tablelands, I think. Yeah. Um I was at a cupping recently at Skybury doing some research with um, Southern Cross University. Okay. On the flavour of Australian coffee. But for the first time, I kind of had met all the farmers in the room at the same time oh. on the tablelands with a large majority. Okay. And that was exciting. Yeah. Some How many are characters. there? I think there's six or seven. Okay. I know of five bigger ones. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. But that was cool. Yeah. I think having a diverse mix of people in, a, in a, any industry oh, makes it much more interesting. Definitely. And you I need that. I think brings, you know, some real fresh energy yep to the you know coffee growing scene in the mm -hmm. tape lands yep. <laughs> and some real guts she's yeah, yeah she's uh definitely she's, gutsy. she's going all in yep. yeah it's, it's great Love it. <laughs> <laughs> and the coffee the experiments she's doing up there are incredible they're really young yeah they yeah, are like world class so how now i'm going back to coffee again is it the um fermenting process that changes the flavors partly yeah, what, what the farmer chooses to do when they pick the cherries mm -hmm. to process that, you know, dry, um, process the seed out of the cherry and dry it out. There's a couple of main um, ways to do that and a whole bunch of variations. But essentially the way they choose to do that provides the most flavour mm -hmm. potential of the okay. coffee. So this natural coffee is um, it's just dried out in the sun. Yeah. That produces that really fruity flavor usually it's like produce yeah it's the same thing yeah you know you buy a i don't know a good fennel i use apples but everyone eats apples you know you buy a good apple that's locally grown or you pick it off the tree and it's you know one thing and you buy it off the supermarket shelf mm, and it's something else totally and there's a whole range of quality and age and yeah yeah I guess wine is another really good comparison with coffee yeah. because there's a process that happens after, you know, with the fruit to mm. convert it to something else, you know, through that ferment. So high, you know, high quality, no. Interesting and, um, you know, delicious wines are often really about the fruit. Okay. And the soil. Yeah. And I think the same for coffee. And then there's vanilla. Yeah, we have vanilla here, vanilla local vanilla. Yeah, so exciting. this is the vanilla that I've been talking about um, a little bit online that is grown locally to me by a friend of mine, wild vanilla grown in the rainforest. It smells amazing. Um, I brought some different um, extracts for Ollie to assess <laughs> because he's like, he's got the, the nose and the palate. <laughs> so these are going to be sold very soon but we're, they're um, working on the exact culturing process and timing and temperatures and all of that kind of thing so it's very mm. exciting but we're going to have the beans and the powder available through my store soon and um, local stores so that'll be exciting that'll be exciting yeah mm. i think we should use more produce yeah locally. yeah locally i think there's a there's a challenge as a cafe owner to um, I mean, I use some in Georgia because they buy all the local produce and I can just ring up, all chefs can ring up and order it, which is great. But I think there's a disconnect between, you know, a, a broader range of pro smaller producers yeah. who don't fit within a particular wholesale network niche. They don't make enough, maybe? Yeah, maybe oh. it's really seasonal. Yeah. Often so these things. Um, like finger limes. In finger lime season, oh, I buy 
you know, 60, 80 kilos and we just process it over a few weeks and freeze mm. it down. Yep. Um, in the so kitchens. the finger lime that you use on your avocado toast, which is award winning, by the way, yes. yeah. very good. I just had it for mm. my brunch with, with Queensland scallops. Mm. Um, yeah. So good. So is that fresh or frozen? We're frozen it. Oh, so because it still it. tastes really fresh. Yeah, it's one of those great um, commercial products, I guess, that you can keep in store oh, well. Okay. Yeah. Because I, I sell the freeze-dried finger lime slices, but yeah, I love that you can freeze it and it's not just mush. Yeah. It's still got each little... Yeah. I don't know what those things are Sphere. called. Sphere. Something. Pulp. <laughs> It's not like pomegranate, it's not So I buy from a farmer called uh, Rob, his name is. He's down in uh, near Ennisvale. Okay. Lily Shire Limes. So he grows limes yeah. and finger limes and a couple of other bits and pieces. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So That's um, good. Most of his finger limes go to Melbourne markets, he was telling me the other day. Okay. There you yeah. go. I bet they cost a lot down there. <laughs> they do. Yeah, we're yeah. very lucky up here, aren't we? We've got so much interesting produce. Yeah. I think it'd be nice to have... I don't know if it's a project for me, but for someone for sure. <laughs> Come on, you can do it. Add yeah. it to the list. <laughs> uh, that's why I end up going into these things. I'm like, oh, no, no. Oh, here there. I go again. <laughs> I'll do it. Um, I don't want to do this, but maybe, I'll, who knows. But, but yeah, just that wholesale. I think there's a there's room for a wholesale a wholesaler who connects farmers with cafes yeah. and restaurants. Because in cafes and restaurants, we really have limited time and resources oh, yeah. to go and search these products or figure out when they're coming in that season mm. and out of season. Um, you know, I think that that'd be a fun little business for someone. Yeah, well, there is. So the guy that I get my CSA box from, um, Real Food Network. Do you know oh, him, yes. Chris? Yeah, Chris. Yeah, yeah. So he he delivers the local produce every week. Mm. Um, I've been doing that for ever since they started I've been getting that so that's years now yeah. Um, but yeah every time it's just so interesting it's like Christmas it's like what's in there today and then it's just, it's kind of like what I was saying with with getting a quarter of a beast or half a lamb or mm. whatever it's just whatever you have you work with and it makes you so creative and you start trying things that you wouldn't have tried before and you don't get stuck in a rut it's great I love it uh, but he, I know it does challenge a lot of people and they're just like I don't know what to do with this um, but it would be good to, I don't know, it would be good to be able to use more of that. But yeah, it is a, I suppose it is a bit hard when you're trying to boom, 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 get meals out. You've got to have someone sorting all that, sourcing it all. Mm. And we I guess in cafes, we're looking for um, ingredients that are mostly available all year. Yeah, that's true. Changing. What do you do with avocados? Is there, is there varieties that sort of yeah. fill in the spots all we're year. We're really lucky here. There's only yeah. two, three or four weeks mm. of the year. Oh, wow. Yeah. And, Where you uh, just can't get them. Yeah. Well, they still come in. They come in from California for okay, about four yeah. weeks of the year. Yeah. That's pretty good though, four weeks. Amazing. Mm. Yeah. Um, the other products, you know, it's, it's hard to change a menu. Yeah. And keep it changing, mm. I find. Yeah. So I find there's a really find balance between all the things on the menu and the ingredients you have in your fridge and the capacity of your chefs and the number of seats you have and you know, the brain these, power and the yeah, recipe development inputs. and <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah it's it's uh yeah i mean it works for my dad i guess because he it was a small restaurant you know. and three nights a week exactly mm. yeah that two lunches easy. three dinners okay yeah I think sometimes you just did Friday and Saturday night dinner as well, you know, mm. four sit-ins yep. with 20 or 30 people, book-ins only, you know. So it's a different kettle of fish altogether, really. Yeah. So he was able to be creative and yeah. change things fairly frequently and even just on the fly, you know, just rub it off the chalkboard and change it. Yep. That's all gone. We'll add this. Yeah. <laughs> that's, the kind of, that's the kind of cafe or restaurant I would love to have, but yeah, it's like you say, it's full on. If you're doing it every day. Yeah. Well, so if you ever open one like that, open it on the table ends, okay? Yeah, I think that's the place to have one. <laughs> I think that's what I'm gently working towards. Good. Yeah. <laughs> but I think that process is a lot to expect of, yeah. you know, chefs and it um, is. kitchen team and front of house team who are, you know, working 40 hours a week. Yeah, constantly trying to figure out where they are at. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, it's a small, smaller thing. It would be nice to go there. 
It would. Yeah. Mm. I find that the, you know, the degustations and the fine dining restaurants that are really um, innovative, mostly in the cities because that's where the people live, who have the money to spend on that sort of mm. dining experience. You know, they, they, that's what it's all about. Okay, yeah. Many of them have their own farms now mm. and use a network of, you know, local farmers. Yeah. Like Ben and mm. Rach up at Oak Beach, you know, they've got that cooking, cooking class thing Beach. they do. Uh, nearly at Port Douglas. Oh, and, and I didn't do, know about that. Yeah, you should go check them out. I should. Yeah, right up and early. It'd be I'm great, great to interview. Okay. So they grow... <laughs> On the list. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they grow, they've got a big Thai garden. You know, Thai oh, nice. ingredient yep. focus garden, um, and you know, most of their food is Thai, I guess. Or at least so inspired. fresh, perfect for up here. Yeah, mm. exactly. That's the sort of food you want to eat. Yes. Super yummy. I went the other night to their new venue in Port Douglas, Jungle Fowl. Oh. Very well worth a visit. Okay. Had a great time. Awesome food. Great service. Oh, that sounds amazing. Yeah, really fun. Good to know. What was it called? Jungle Fowl. Jungle Fowl. Come Port check Douglas. It out. There you go, guys. Yep. Hot tip. I'm always asking Ollie, like, what restaurants are good because he knows. I really think you should make this list that you've been saying you're going to make. <laughs> yeah. Where to go in far north Queensland. Yeah, I think there's a, it's a bunch of, you know, along the theme of focused on local produce, there's yeah. a bunch of restaurateurs doing that. You know, Craig from Oka. Yeah. He's been doing it for many, many mm. years here. And, yep. you know, focusing and showcasing on and you on kangaroo and crocodile That's and daily right. week. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And Nunu, you know, yeah. Nico from Palm Cove. He's... And you used to work there, didn't you? I worked there yeah. for a year with those guys. Yeah, just every mm. year. That was fun, fun house. Yeah, that's that's a good restaurant. I've been there. Yeah, really good. Love it. Mm. Well, if you are in the Cairns area, make sure you pop in and visit Gayala because this is a great place to mm. get a good coffee or three and, <laughs> and um, beautiful food and also caffeine in Grafton Street, I believe. And hopefully one day there'll be one on the Tablelands too. <laughs> Very likely. Yeah. Woo! Be good. I'm hoping so. A little farm. Yeah. Little restaurant. Yep. Oh, the dream. That would be so nice. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so. Well, thank you, Ollie. Thank you. Thanks for sharing, and oh, I hope you guys you. enjoyed that. Um, pop over to the website, which is. Which website? You've got a lot of websites. I'll just put some links below. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Ollie. I'm just testing the vanilla here. extract from wild vanilla. This is the most fragrant with our flowers.